Hello friends, it's Jessica from Three Rivers Homestead and I'm coming to you from beautiful Northwest Ohio where we started the week with the most amazing weather. It was 70 degrees and it really felt like a taste of spring. We spent a lot of time on Sunday and Monday outside just enjoying the homestead and then focusing on trying to also get a little bit of work done. So in this week's video, I'm going to take you along and I'm going to show you those projects that we were able to accomplish. We're going to get into the garden for a little bit and do some of our first planting, some direct sowing for the year. We're also going to do a little bit of planting indoors. We're going to do a couple of canning projects. We're going to can sweet potatoes. We're also going to can some beef and broth. And then I'm going to make a beef pot pie out of some of that beef that we were working with, as well as some homemade sorbet. So if you're interested in any of that, why don't you stick around? It's becoming a busier time of year. The slowness of the winter is fading and the homestead work is really starting to amp up. I'm doing a lot of planning. You guys know I do planning every week for things like meals and for our homeschool work that needs accomplished. But this time of year, there's also a lot of planning that I need to do around the homestead. So I'm working on garden layouts and seed starting schedules and all of the other big projects that we have planned for this year, getting ready to plant some fruit trees here in the next couple of weeks. And so placing some orders for the trees that we would like to add to our growing orchard, lots of things like that. And despite eating almost exclusively off of our pantry stores over the last several months, we are still looking very good. You know, food preservation season doesn't begin for about three more months. And so I'm very happy with what we still have stocked away that should last us through until this year's growing season will start to replenish um, what we have used up. Now we are emptying quite a bit of jars and you guys know that my rule is that every time I empty seven quart jars or a batch of nine pint jars I will fill them up with something else but here towards the end of March it's going to be time to stop that and start really letting those empties accumulate because we are now planting the 2024 garden and we're going to need empty jars to fill it with all of our harvests that we want to preserve for the year. So as I mentioned the weather was gorgeous and I knew that we would have some rain later in the week after these really warm sunny days so it was a great opportunity to try planting some seeds. Now that is a gamble here in northwest Ohio because the temperatures could still drop in March and April again but I felt like taking a little bit of a gamble this year. So we planted some radishes and some lettuce. We started some new herbs like cilantro. Um, we did some bunching onions. Then I went and started pruning some of my fruit trees. I wanted to make sure to get them pruned before they start to bud. And we have a small orchard. Most of our trees are just maybe three or four years old. Um, but they're starting to produce. This apple tree last year gave us about a bushel's worth. So we're hoping with proper care and some pruning, we will have even more this year. I don't start a lot of seeds indoors, but this week it was time to start my loofah seeds. Now loofah, it's a squash, and if you let it fully mature and dry on the vine or even off the vine, inside turns into this beautiful loofah sponge. So we grow these I cut them up after they're dried into these little pieces and I like to use them mainly as my egg scrubbers. They're very gentle but they also will get any of the grit and grime off of any dirty eggs that come in from the coop. And then I love the fact that they're compostable. And then I also make soap. I make loofah soap. You can see inside of this soap there is a piece of loofah in there. So as you use it, it's exfoliating and has a little bit of scrubby in it. So I grow my own loofah every year and I saved some seeds from last year's uh, crop. And usually I just need about three, maybe four at the most loofah plants and that provides everything we need for our family. Now you may be wondering why I'm starting these loofah plants so early when you can basically direct sow other squashes into the garden after your last frost date. And that's because the loofah take a really long time to fully mature so that the insides have that sponge-like texture. And I find that if I start the seeds at the same time I start my other squash seeds, 
they will not be mature enough before our um, first frost in the fall. So I start my loofah usually in the beginning of March. By this time of year, I've really only started so far my peppers and my brassicas and now these loofahs. And then next week we will start tomatoes. Now that temperatures are warming up, the temperature in our cellar will probably rise a bit. Throughout the winter, it remained around 40 degrees down there, and that was perfect storage uh, conditions for a lot of our root veggies and, and things like that. But now that it's starting to get warmer, we're going to start creeping up to, you know, 50, maybe even 60 degrees through the summer in the cellar. And so I know that these sweet potatoes that I had down there in storage aren't going to be th their best for much longer. So I had this box about three quarters of the way full and decided that maybe I should can some. Not only would it help preserve them um, before they start to go soft, but it will also make for some really quick and easy meals here during the busy gardening season. This spring, it's really hard to make home-cooked meals because we get really busy working outside and I want to have some convenience foods. And so this is a great way to stock the shelves with some side dishes that I can just dump and heat up. So the first thing I need to do is peel my sweet potatoes. Um, you really do want to peel any of your root veggies because the peels are where the main risk of botulism exists. And then once we have them peeled, it is really simple. All we need to do is just cube them up into little pieces and fill our jars. I do this the same exact way I do my squash. And the great thing is that having this canned sweet potato, it is a great substitute for squash. So I'll use these sometimes in um, recipes that will call for canned pumpkin or canned butternut squash. I'll make muffins and pies and all sorts of things like that with these. They are just really a great treat to have. And like I said, they're convenient because all the work is done. They're already peeled and cooked up and I'll just be able to dump one of these jars into a pan or into a soup or some or something and it will just need to be warmed up since it's already pre-cooked. As always, I have a little helper who was curious and wanted to try his hand at helping mama and I love having my children in the kitchen with me underfoot. I feel like they're learning life skills and um, it just enjoy the company when canning can get kind of boring or, or redundant. Having the children around sure is fun. So now that all my jars are filled, I am just going to raw pack these. I am putting water straight out of our tap into the jars. So it's just going to be room temperature water. And that is fine. As long as we put room temperature water into the canner, they will all come up to temperature together as the canner heats up. Now the next thing I'm going to need to do is debubble my jars and make sure that I am maintaining the appropriate headspace of about one inch after I remove all of those bubbles. From there, we're ready to put our lids on. I'm using four jars canning lids. These are the absolute best canning lids. I have the best um, seal rates out of any other lids that I've ever used. So if you would like 10% off of some of the best lids that you can find, check out the link in the video description and use my code and you can save yourself 10%. Now once we get all of these lids and rings on, these are going to go into the pressure canner for 90 minutes. This time of year I like to save some of my canning projects for days where I have maybe other intensive kitchen work to do. And while I'm in the kitchen babysitting the canner, I can get other work done. So this really, I mean, it only took me maybe 30 minutes to get everything peeled and into the jars. And then as I'm working on the next meal and doing some other prep work, I'll just babysit the canner until I get it to pressure. And this really does in the long run save me time because I think about the time that it would take me to do, you know, the three or four meals individually that all of these jars will encompass in the future. And I feel like doing it all at once ahead of time just really is convenient. So 90 minutes later, we had our canned sweet potatoes and I'm really excited to head, add these down to the pantry shelves. The rest of that box of sweet potatoes will be used in meals in the next few weeks. 
I'm still working on clearing beef out of our freezer in preparation for our steer that we're going to have processed here in April. And I found a bunch of packages of these center cut beef shanks. And these are basically the beef equivalent of a ham hock. They are part of the leg of the cow, which means it's extremely tough meat. They have a really nice bone in the middle that's full of marrow. And so because that meat is so tough, they're really only good when, when it's stewed, when it's slow cooked over a long period of time, and that really tenderizes the meat. So what I'm doing is filling the roaster with as many of these beef shanks as I possibly can, and then we're going to make some broth. We're going to let this all cook overnight for about 12 hours in the roasting pan to tenderize and make broth at the same time. So I'm adding some frozen celery greens that were from last year's garden. I've also done a poor job of using these up over the winter. So I wanna get these put to use and I thought this was the perfect place to do that. We're also gonna add three cubes of garlic scape puree. The garlic scape is the flowering stalk of the garlic plant that has a very mild garlic flavor, it's delicious. Also gonna sprinkle in some bay leaves for flavor. And then I have some whole peppercorn and then some celery salt that we made from homegrown freeze-dried celery last fall. I had forgotten about this and I need to start using it. And then I also had a jar of freeze-dried tomatoes that I thought would make a good addition. And then from there, I'm just gonna fill the roaster the rest of the way up with some water. And as I mentioned, this will simmer overnight. I put it on low on about 200 degrees. We want it low and slow to really tenderize that meat. And it smelled amazing through the night cooking. When I woke up in the morning, I was so hungry for some broth. Um, but I love using my roaster here because it can make a ton of broth at one time. So the great thing about this little project that I'm working on is that it will give us some meat to can and it will also give us a ton of broth to can and we'll fill lots of jars to put back into the pantry. So the next morning I pulled the lid off and then it was done and all I needed to do was let this cool down a little bit before I could start working with it. After it cooled for a little bit, I decided to strain the broth and start filling some big half gallon jars with it. I want to get all of the broth out of my roaster first, and then I can start picking out the bones and really get to the meat in there and fill some jars with meat. But first, as I mentioned, I need to get all of that broth out. You can never have enough bone broth. It's really one of the easiest things to pressure can. If you ever wanna get started with pressure canning, it's a great place to start. So out of that roaster, we ended up with two gallons of beautiful, delicious beef broth that we will definitely put to use. And here's what we had left, lots of bones. I'm gonna make sure I get all of the marrow out of those bones before we toss them. And then I, pulled out some of that beef to set aside for dinner. I'm gonna make a beef pot pie with that. And then what we have left here is just some of the remaining celery and meat that we can use to fill our jars that we are gonna can for future meals. So hopefully each one of these quart jars could make me a small beef pot pie in the future, or I could do a large one out of two quart jars. Now that I've got all of my jars here full of meat, I'm just taking some of that broth to fill them up the rest of the way. We're gonna need to debubble these jars and then adjust the headspace to one inch also on this beef. Next thing, we need to make sure to wipe the rims of those because they're very oily from the fat in that broth and meat. And then as always, using those four jars canning lids, once again, make sure to check out the link in the description not only do I love their lids, but they have the nifty um, lid remover tool that you'll see me use later on in this video. You can also purchase that there, um, and they have a great deal on that. So then these are also going to go into the pressure canner for 90 minutes. And when we were done, we had all of these beautiful quarts of meat, and then I had one of just plain broth that I stuck in there as well. And this is what we have left over to work on for dinner. You can see that I have three of these half gallon jars left of broth, and you can definitely see the difference in these between the broth here that was strained first out of the top of the roaster 
and then you go over to the one in the middle and then the one at the end or the bottom of the roaster and the difference in the fat content the stuff on the top had way more fat in it so I can use this broth in different applications where I want more or less fat and then it's time to get started on dinner I needed some wheat berries and thankfully I had a teenage son in the next room that I could send down into the cellar to bring me up a 50 pound bag of wheat berries so that I could get those into my buckets and get started grinding the wheat for my pot pie. Now I don't always sift my freshly ground wheat but when I am making a pie crust I do like to sift that. So the first step is to put those wheat berries through the grinder. I have a Nutramil grain mill and then I have to take that ground wheat and put it through my sifter attachment that sits on top of my Bosch mixer. That pulls out the bran here that we save to feed our mealworm farm. And then on the bottom of my mixer is all of that beautiful sifted flour that is perfect for pastries. And then it's time for me to get ready making a pie crust. So this is my really easy method for making a pie crust. I'm making a double batch. So I'm putting approximately five cups of that flour into my food processor. And from there, I'm going to add about one cup of, um, I'm using palm fruit shortening on this day. You could use lard or butter, any kind of fat. Then we're going to sprinkle in a little bit of salt. And then add just about a half a cup of cold water. And that's it. We're going to put the food processor on and it's going to do the work of cutting that fat into the flour and mixing up our pie crust for us. I love this. It just takes like three or four minutes and the work is done for me. There was a time where I didn't really like to rely on my kitchen gadgets. For some reason, I thought doing it all by hand, maybe it was superior, but the the older that I've gotten and the busier that I've got I've gotten, I have realized the blessing in having these gadgets that make work easier for me. It's just I couldn't get a lot of this from scratch cooking done without some of these appliances and labor saving devices that really make my life easier. And I am very grateful um, for many of these appliances. So I portioned that crust out into two pieces. One of them is going to be the bottom of our rather large baking dish and then the other one will be for the top. I'm, I'm not going for a pretty pie on this day. I just need a big one to feed my large family. This is going to need to feed nine people tonight. So I've got my two crusts done and now we need to work on the filling for our beef pot pie. So there is that beef that I saved from the canning process. Now to that, I'm going to add two bags of these frozen organic mixed vegetables from Aldi. Um, I love these. They're such a great deal, and they're so convenient for nights like this um, when I just want to put together a quick meal. Then I have some freeze-dried onions that I'm just crushing up with my fingers because they were cut rather large, and I don't want big pieces of onion in our pot pie, so I'm, I can just crush those up with my hands and sprinkle that into the pot going to stir that around so that I can assess how much broth I'm going to need to add to this. Adding a little bit of that broth left over from the process that we made it earlier, adding some more celery salt, some parsley, and then a half a cup here of arrowroot powder. I like to use arrowroot powder as my thickener in most of my um, pie fillings and things like this, my meat pies. So all we need to do is stir that around and then we're going to set it aside, um, pull back out our pan and, and get that filling poured into the crust. This is pretty much my same process for making any pot pie. Sometimes I do this with chicken, I do this with turkey, and my process is pretty much always the same and I use the same ingredients. This time it's going to be extra delicious because of that beef shank meat that we slow roasted with all of those delicious flavorings. This one's going to turn out amazing. So we got that in the oven on 350 and it baked for almost an hour. And while it was baking, I decided to make some homemade sorbet for the family. I got a new ice cream maker and I have a lot of bags of these frozen peaches um, to use up. And so I figured why not work on some sorbet? So all I'm doing is 
filling my blender here with a little bit of frozen peaches. I'm not measuring or anything. I probably make my sorbet differently every time I do it. You really can't go wrong. So any kind of frozen fruit, and then you add some fruit syrup. I'm adding one pint here of peach vanilla syrup. This is a failed batch of jelly from 2022. And then I'm adding two little half pints of some failed Concord grape jelly. Why are these failed batches? Well, they were because I was experimenting with low sugar recipes um, before I used Pomona's pectin, and that is why they failed to set. And so all I need to do is blend this together. This is actually my favorite way to use failed batches of jelly because it makes the most amazing sorbet. The sugar and the sweetness is already in there with the fruit syrup. Add any kind of frozen fruit and then just pour it into your ice cream maker. Um, before I had an ice cream maker, I would do this. I would just take a bowl and put it in the freezer, and then about every hour I would pull it out and stir it around a little bit and then put it back in. It's just a little more work to do it that way, and it takes longer. This machine just makes it much more convenient, and we were spending so much money on dairy-free ice creams for my family. It takes sometimes three pints maybe more if the kids are having a lot of ice cream and the dairy-free versions are so expensive that I will get more than my money's worth out of this ice cream maker by the end of the summer, I'm sure, because it costs much less to use the ingredients that I already have in the house and just put them into the ice cream maker. So um, our beef pot pie here finished up and I'm just getting that plated out. I don't think there's an easy way to get that out and make it still look pretty, but it doesn't matter what it looks like. These kids are going to eat it up. They are hungry. And I have these three. These are my three youngest children. Hannah is one, Benjamin is three, and John is five just for about another week. He's about to turn six. And so these little guys are probably the three pickiest eaters in my house if they don't like it, they're going to let you know. And so I always know that if they're eating their bowls and enjoying it, that it is rather delicious. So don't let the appearance of that beef pot pie fool you. It actually did taste really good. And the children gobbled that whole thing up. And so this one was a success. I'll always be the first one to say it. And I have no shame in saying it, that sometimes ugly food makes the best meals and when you are feeding uh, a family of 10, three meals a day, you know, oftentimes from scratch, you just need to get bellies full. It's a lot of work. And so um, it doesn't have to be the fanciest looking meal. It just needs to be made of healthy ingredients and taste good. And that's what matters. And speaking of tasting good, this sorbet was amazing. All of my children said that it was better than the store-bought stuff we buy. And this one was essentially made of... <laughs> other ingredients that would otherwise be a waste. Failed batches of jelly turned into a really delicious food. So that was it for the projects that I really wanted to share with you this week. By the end of the week, the weather had gotten rather chilly again and rainy, but that is a blessing because hopefully it will help all of those seeds that we planted germinate. We are also enjoying our new puppy, Sarah Jane, that I introduced you to in last week's video, and she's spending a lot of time outside just being socialized to the animals and the other dogs and the children, and they are enjoying her so much. Now we have a lot of fun things coming up this weekend. So last week was my daughter Elizabeth's 11th birthday. And this weekend is my daughter Grace's 13th birthday. And then next week will be my son John's sixth birthday. It is heavy birthday season here. So I have David, my baker, busy making cakes for all of his siblings. It is a blessing to have a baker in the house um, because mama doesn't have to make the birthday cakes. He always volunteers to do it and loves it. So I hope that you all have had a wonderful week and enjoyed the beautiful weather wherever you are. We will be back next week with more fun projects here at Three Rivers Homestead. Until then, I hope you all are blessed, and we will see you later, friends. Bye.